but we got uh, a, a, a full evening uh, tonight. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Ian. Uh, Ian is, is obviously a member of the Richmond Lodge, uh, a very, very dear member of the Richmond Lodge. Uh, and he's going to take us through the history of our lodge. And hopefully everyone finds that uh, quite interesting. So uh, I'll hand over to Ian. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, Sid. Um, when you get to a certain stage, you think I've talked enough, please jump in and tell me to shut up. Richmond Lodge as a lodge, the lodge we know it today, started when they formed the Victorian Constitution. The Victorian Constitution started operating in Victoria in 1883 and Richmond became number 10. It was the first lodge that was started under that constitution. But I'll go back a few years because in Australia there was operating the English, Scottish and Irish constitutions. And in a petition to commence a lodge in the 24th, on the 24th of August, 1858, and when you've got to think about that, that's 10 years earlier when Melbourne really was proclaimed as a city. And it was only 12 years earlier, which is two years before that 10, that John Batman and his wife and family arrived to settle from Tasmania to really start up what is now the, the city of Melbourne and organised a treaty with local inhabitants for the land. But the warrant, although the lodge had its first meeting in 58, 19, 1859, they were given a, a warrant from England to allow them to start Richmond Lodge number 1093. And that lodge operated as a lodge here under a, an approval by, we believe, a, a provincial grand officer. It was in a letter from the United Grand Lodge of England received about 40 years ago, it said that they can find no trace of a warrant in their archives and doubt the lodge was ever formally consecrated as the ceremony of consecration was in the development around that time in England. One of the problems was that you had all sorts of organisations, whether it's through the services, the army and, and people like that, the police force that was even sent out from England that started the the, the country of Australia, there was a lot of Freemasons. And so they started meetings, but they were sending information back to England to get approval. But when you think uh, the turnaround of a ship might have been a year and um, paperwork in between, it took a hell of a long time for things to arrive in this country. I do have proof of the payment of fees with the copy of the annual return sent to London between 1859 and 1865. And again, a throwback. The transatlantic call from the Queen to the United States President in 1858 was the first ever transatlantic phone call, but there was no cable to Australia until 1900. So it's not just down the road, it was a long way away. They held their first meeting, official meeting, at the Admiral Napier Hotel in what was known as Lonsdale Street, East Melbourne. I tried to find that on some old maps, but there was no luck, but it could have been Lonsdale Street as we know it today that was extended further than it is now. 14 members attended that meeting in addition to three past masters, several past grand officers and nine visiting brethren. The volume of the sacred law was presented to the lodge by the foundation junior warden, brother George M. Nichols. Remember that name, it's very relevant later. The cover has his name engraved, or it's actually debossed upon it. Um, regular meetings of the lodge were held on the first Tuesday after the full moon. And again, brethren, you've got to think about it in the days of the 1800s, to get to and from lodge, you need natural light because there were no street lights. So meetings were often held around full moon so that brethren could get home. Um, the 7 p.m. on ordinary nights and 4.30 p.m. start on banquet nights. The first five candidates for initiation were William B. Burnley, gentleman, 
Burnley Street, Richmond was named after him. W. Weir, he was a builder in Richmond. Henry G. Cameron, the town clerk of Richmond. Michael Egan, the timber, timber merchant in Richmond. W. Gregory, a physician. They were duly elected and, elected and initiated on the 29th of September, 1858, after signing the usual declaration. The first colonial return was sent to England dated the 31st of December, 1858. In the return, it shows there were 20 founder members, eight initiates, three joining members. One of the initiates was a Lewis Thomas Clark Torrens, Jr., the son of Thomas Clark Torrens, who was a foundation member. But the most important name in the joining members is Brother George Self Coppin, MLC. Age 42 years, gentleman, a member of the Scottish Constitution number 366, who joined on the 23rd of November 1858. I believe that this is the brother who became the first Grand Master of the Victorian Constitution, AA, that was in um, 1853, uh, sorry, 1883, and it became known, Victorian Constitution became known as the Coppin Grand Lodge. And he would have been 67 in 1883. He was also a number, a member of a number of lodges. He must have travelled massive distances because he went to lodges in South Australia and Tasmania. And again, this is 1880s, 1870s. But this is the or 1860s actually, because he joined um, this lodge coming to Australia as I said, a member of the Scottish Constitution Lodge Number 366. In 1863, the, lob the English Constitution Lodge operated until the 4th of August, 1863. And it was lodge, still Lodge Number 1093. But on the 29th of September of 1863, the Grand Lodge of England did a number reorganisation because they had so many lodges around the world, they needed to shorten the gaps between all the lodges that have started and folded. And a new number was number 791, English Constitution. Now, the number 1093 is in existence today, and you can look it up on the web because they're a lodge still operating. They are Lodge Anchor of Hope, Madras, India. I haven't looked up for over a year, but uh, 12 months or so ago, they had uh, a master going in the chair. That lodge was consecrated in 1865. And as I said, it's still operating today. But the last meeting of this English Constitution Lodge number 791 was shown in the appearance book on the 25th of August, 1869. Six members, five visitors signed in. After that, the lodge lapsed. So there is actually no connection between our lodge of today, which was started in 1883, and this old lodge but we have all the paperwork because sometime in the 1930s it was passed down to a member of our lodge. It's been transferred on and it's out in the shed in the back. I've got it all, nobody wants it, but I've got it. But during the 11 years of existence of that lodge, 88 gentlemen became Freemasons. George Nichols, the foundation junior warden was elected worshipful master a year later and the name the last name recorded of a candidate for initiation in the declaration book was in 1858, sorry, uh, 1869, is Richard Coop, lead merchant who lived in a Beckett Street, Melbourne. Now, if you've ever been into the Daimaru building, which is a shopping complex these days, there's a shot tower. And that shot tower is Coop's shot tower. The name is still on it to this day. And the irony of the whole thing, I went to Queensland to the Melaleuca Resort many years ago at Palm Cove. Talking with the owners, the woman is a descendant of Coop. So there's a lot of funny connections. But uh, as I said, the books were handed over to our lodge. And the main connection between that lodge and this lodge is if you put your hand on the volume of the sacred law that is used in the lodge and has been used in the lodge for the last 60 years or more, 
uh, sorry, when we're talking 70, 80, probably 90 years, so 1930s, it was found, is the volume of the sacred law from this English Constitution Lodge because it's got George Nichols engraved on the cover. We still have the volume of the sacred law from the foundation of Richmond Lodge number 80, well, number 10, which became 89, um, but it's not in as good condition. So it's, it's not used. But as I said, this lodge wasn't formed until 1883. In 1883, a meeting of Freemasons was held at the Vine Hotel. And brethren, we haven't changed. We still go back to the pubs. The Vine Hotel, Bridge Road, Richmond. The present, present were brothers Whitaker, Hutchison, Smith Hall and Mitchell and several apologies received from interested brethren. A uh, petition was uh, raised to form a new lodge under what is now known as, at those days, the Victorian Constitution with George Coppin being the Grand Master. The report of the meeting was put in the Australian and the Guardian on the 14th of July, 1883. An application was made for dispensation of Richmond Lodge number 10 until a warrant of constitution had been obtained. Um, at this meeting, the foundation officers were nominated and the regular night of the second Tuesday in each month was set for meetings to be held at the Vine Hotel, Bridge Road, Richmond. The foundation worshipful master was Brother Chas Whitaker, the Grand Secretary, came along to the meeting, and but he'd also offered us the use of furniture and regalia for that opening night. It was postponed, the request of the uh, Grand Secretary, until August, 21st of August, 1883. And on that date, Brother Chas Whitaker was duly invested as worshipful master. Ten candidates for initiation were proposed at the meeting, and on the 4th of September was fixed by the Worshipful Master as an emergency meeting for initiation purposes. At the emergency meeting, six of the proposed candidates were balloted, elected, and three of them were then initiated. At the regular meeting on the 11th of September, two candidates were initiated and one passed to the degree of a fellow craft. So there's a good night for you, brethren. Two firsts and a second. But after considerable uh, correspondence with the Grand Lodge of the time, it wasn't until April 84 that the Lodge was consecrated. So it took time to get round to this. Um, Brother Whitaker was probably installed as the Worship of Master at that consecration in April 84, and it's probably the last meeting he went to because in 83, although the lodge was started, we'd been oper operating under dispensation. So it wasn't until 84, we had an official meeting. And as I said, the last meeting that George, um, sorry, Chas Whitaker went to, which was the foundation worshipful master, was April 84. Because an emergency meeting had to be held at 1 p.m. on a Saturday on the 23rd of August in 84 to conduct the funeral of Worshipful Brother Whitaker, our, found ma our foundation master who had died the previous day. The brethren proceeded to the grave where the funeral ceremony was conducted by Brother Robert Mitchell, Worshipful Master, and then returned to the lodge room after which the lodge was closed at 3.40 p.m. On the motion of Brother Goddard, President of the Board of Benevolence, it was re resolved that donations be invited and members present at this meeting contributed and placed on the volume of the sacred law the sum of ten pounds twelve shillings and sixpence to assist the immediate wants of the deceased's family at the next meeting an appeal was opened for this purpose the appeal fund resulted in securing a house in richmond by a substantial deposit the interesting part of the funeral was that it was conducted by brother john allison of yarra yarra lodge who did it at little expense to the family. Allison, Allison Monkhouse is still around to these days. But in 1889, the formation of the United Grand Lodge of Victoria, when you look at the combination between English, Scottish, Irish and the Victorian Constitution, 
we, Richmond Lodge got involved and on the 12th of March, 1889, our allegiance was tendered to the new lodge constitution and 25 financial members signed it all up. The first meeting of this lodge under the new constitution was held on the 9th of April, 89. And at a meeting in November in 1889, we were told our number had changed from number 10 to number 89. Now, Sid, I could go on for ages because I know I've got this, Richmond's got so much. One of the things that I like to point out to people is that when you look at what this lodge has had over the years as members, massive amount of fathers and sons and or even grandfathers and sons right down through the line. Uh, you were saying a moment ago, Matt, that Doug Newbury had signed on. Doug's family was a father and four sons, I think, and Doug will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but you're looking at a range of families, and I've often talked about Harding brothers. Recently, only uh, towards the end of last year, we lost Alan Harding, but John's still alive. But his father, their uncle, their grandfather, and many right. long going back a long, long time, were all members of this lodge. Um, I'll just go through a few interesting names. People that are Victorian interested in football. Francis Vane Hughes was known as Checker because he worked in a, a Richmond leather factory and he was a, a checker at the leather factory. But he was a great coach of the Melbourne Football Club. His brother was a member, John Henry Stanley Hughes. And his son, also Francis Vane Hughes, was a member up until Frank died about oh, 15, 20 years ago. But a great man. Uh, Owen Kazali, connected to the Kazalis. We've had uh, C.C. Grant was a member and his son, Colin Campbell, Alan Grant, became a member. Dolph Eddy, a member of the Legislative Assembly in Victoria, was a member for many years. Roy Allison, of the descendants of the Allison Connection. William Orty, he was a member with three sons. But a, a name that most people in Australia would know as part of the Whitlam government was Dr. James Ford Cairns. Jim was a member of this lodge from 58 until 81. Um, I think he got asked to leave, but that was only... Yeah, that's right. He was asked to leave. He yeah. was against the government of the day with the moratorium over the uh, Vietnam War. And uh, I think someone in the hierarchy, not of our lodge, but further up the chain, asked him to move on. That's right. The other thing that's interesting when you look back in history and brethren from other lodges uh, would probably know the same thing. The average weekly wage was a fraction of what you, sorry, uh, today's average weekly wage is more than our, our joining fee. But many years ago, the joining fee was three or four weeks pay just your joining fee, your initia uh, initiation fee. Um, Jews at the time were about a week's pay, uh, three or four guineas back in 48. Um, I know it was a week and a bit's pay back in 22. Um, it's, it's just the, yeah, you look at it. Um, I've got one here, 1923. Initiation fee was 10 guineas, 21, $21 as we look at it today. And the average weekly wage at the time was just under $8. So $21, $8 is not quite three times. Um, but the yearly dues were $5, $5 equivalent to $5 today. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's all where at the time it was just one of those things that people had the money. If they wanted to join Freemasonry, it was well and truly paid for. There's a lot of things the Lodge did over the years where donations of £100 here or £50 there or um, various amounts of money. We were a donor at the start of the Freemasons Hospital. We actually bought land 
in 1935 in Copenhagen, named after It was purchased in February. Uh, sorry, it was purchased in 23. It was sold in 35. Um, but we purchased it to build a building, and then Grand Lodge says you can't build a lodge room there, so we have to stop. Again, there's been a number of benefits to our lodge from people joining us at various times. In 18, 1993, we moved from the Masonic Centre East Melbourne, where we used to meet, to the Kew Masonic Temple. The lodge was opened by Strathalbyn Lodge number 885. The lodge meeting closed. Richmond Lodge opened their meeting and the members from Strathalbyn came along and joined us. So it was just a switch around in the room on the night. And so we had a number of people from Strathalbyn Lodge join this lodge. The foundation master was online before. I think he's there somewhere. It was Paul Ray. And he was the foundation master of, Strath of Strathalbyn Lodge in 1985. Um, we had Phoenix Lodge members join us in 19... In... Uh, where did they join? I lost that. It's, um, sorry, I haven't written the date down. I know they were found... Uh, consecrated in 25 but they were a number of the members that joined us from phoenix lodge we had members from lombard lodge of precision and in recent years members from lodge ilata so brethren richmond lodge might be the name but it's morphed over the years with so many people um i have a personal connection to a member who was a, a very good friend and uh I still occasionally see his wife, and that's Hubert Alexander, also known as Curly Bramage. And uh, Curly passed away in 19, uh, mid 1900s, 96, that's right, 1996. Um, but the master of the day now wears his past master's jewel as a perpetual jewel. Curly was a master in this lodge, 71, in 87, and again in 92 and was a fantastic Freemason. Brethren, I could continue to go on, but I think I've talked for long enough. I thank you for your attention, and if you have any queries, look, my email address is getverge at bigpond.com, but um, if you want to ask them tonight too, there's one of the benefits of having all the books. You can look up so much stuff, it's not funny. But thank you very much. Thank you, Worshipful Master. Yeah, and thank you very much for that. It was, uh, again, as enjoyable as it was in, when you presented it in the lodge. Brethren, I, I just want to point out that um, there is a full presentation um, that Ian has made in, in Richmond Lodge um, up on YouTube. So if you subscribe oh. to our YouTube um, uh, uh, posts i'd say um you'd be able to see quite a few of our videos up there and one of them is actually the uh, the full talk that ian has given on the history of, of richmond lodge uh once again ian thank you very much we, we, it, it was like i said as as enjoyable as ever um i would like to open up to any questions if anyone has any questions now's the time to uh, unmute yourself um and feel free to ask uh, ian anything you'd like yes ian it's james nicholas here from yeah. walhalla I found your talk fascinating. It was interesting to hear about people like George Coppin, who obviously was very famous in the theatrical uh, industry amongst many. I, d I just wanted to mention, when, when I was initiated into Freemasonry back in 92, I was initiated at Lorna Street in Hawthorne. Yep. And we had a very old Freemason there who was the master at the time. His name was Lou Shee. Lusheen, that some may remember, is a senior member of many different orders. But Lou, Lou told me that uh, there used to be a Masonic temple in Swan Street, Richmond. And I'm just wondering if you met there at any stage. Richmond did, yes. Yeah, I didn't go through. I, as I said, I, usually when I talk, I'm sorry to say, James, as I, I do talk too much, um, it goes on for about an hour. But... Um, Richmond moved around many places in pubs in Richmond and in history it's interesting to look at we, we're a member having a lot well, the lodge is having meetings in the pub and the, the licensee becomes a member of the lodge and then all of a sudden you got this other name 
initiated as a licensee of the same pub. So the licensee must change, but you're making them a Freemason to get everything right. And we moved from pubs to pubs, and then we moved to Swan Street, Richmond. Now, it's just around the corner from Church Street on the... If you're going from uh, north to south, it's on the east side of uh, Swan Street and on the south side, uh, if you turn... Yeah, if you're going from north, you turn left into Swan Street and it's on the other side. It is now a Greek club. But we never owned the building. We paid for a lot of it, but we never owned it. It was owned by Duke of Richmond, which is number 49 meeting in uh, Waverley. Uh, but uh, for years and years, every time they needed a quid, they'd borrow it from our lodge. <laughs> I've got all the records. And... Uh, when when we said, well, instead of giving it back, let us have a share of the building, no, they paid it back. Um. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. About Duke of Richmond Lodge. Duke of Richmond Lodge now uh, was 39, number 39, 39 and it is uh, no longer in existence. They handed their charter in at Waverley. When was that done? Uh, that was a couple of years ago. Oh, all really? the all the old furniture from the uh, from the Richmond Temple is in their rehearsal room at Waverley. Yeah. yeah, when they set Waverley up, they used that. Yeah. Yeah. There's another question I was going to, and it's just been answered. I often wondered the reason why I was a hundredth master of Richmond Lodge in. Um, in 1983-84 and I must have been the master, I must have been the hundredth one dating back to 1883-84 when it was number 10. Even though I was the number was changed to 89 and 1889. Uh, yeah, we're still still Doug, we're still the same lodge whether they changed our number but our yeah, that's right. was 83 because in 18, 1983, when you had your um, re-consecration, we also had a re-consecration. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, but that's the answer on Duke of Richmond. It is folded. Yeah, I didn't know. Living down the beach now, I don't uh, see a lot of the Melbourne stuff anymore. No, it's only because I go to Melbourne Waverley Mark. Uh, at my own. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate that. Any other just, questions? Uh, James, that uh, the Masonic uh, building in Walsham Street in Richmond is a, um, a co-Masonic. It's a ladies' centre. Uh, but I do recall seeing not that long ago that the building was up for sale. I don't know if it was sold or not. But uh, yeah, it's just around the corner of Church Street. Uh, I'm proposing building, but it's got square encompasses across the top. I did ask the Grand Master some years ago when I was at an installation in Shepparton about it, and he, he did say, he said, yeah, that's a, um, a ladies' Masonic order uh, meeting place. So, there. Bernie Cusche. Bernie Cusche, are you there? Yeah, Bernie. Yeah, um, go for it, buddy. Duke of Richmond has definitely folded. I had a couple of friends who were in that, and uh, I, I know it has definitely folded a couple of years ago. Great. Thanks, Bernie. Thanks, Thanks Bernie. Oh, Good. When, when that building was sold in Swan Street, Richmond, it was sold to a Greek club. Now, they were supposed to take the square and compass off the top because I had that discussion at the time with the people from uh, Duke of Richmond. But it looks like it never happened because it was still there 10 years ago when I left. Was it? Okay. Well, this, this is a different building, you know, off Waltham Street. It's but yeah, it's almost still... behind the pub on the corner. Now, this one's just off. The, it's just down from, um, from um, Bridge Road. <clears throat> so if, you turn, <clears throat> if you're going towards the city, Bridge, uh, Bridge Road, turn left into Church Street. Uh, it's the second street on the right, one street before you get to the... Um, the big church there, just around the corner, the Masonic building there. Yeah, no, it's a different one. The one, yeah. the one that we used to use in Richmond is behind the, 
there's the Swan, the Swan Hotel on the corner of Church and Swan Street, and it's basically behind that. Right. Swan Street, yeah. I guarantee you one thing, when you when I was doing my first degree in the middle of winter in the old Masonic set, in the old Richmond Temple, it was the coldest darn place you could ever get. They had very, very tall ceilings and uh, boy, it was cold. It must have been common in those days for a lot of Masonic orders uh, and craft to meet in hotels. I remember going to um, the Spread Eagle Hotel. I think it's in Richmond or just close by there. Um, and it was owned by worshipful brother Frank Bibby, Bindi, Bibby. And uh, there we had a lot of happy meetings in that hotel. Spread Eagle, it was called. Yeah, it's on the corner of Coppin Street and Bridge Road. Yeah. Um, the guy who had that pub, Peter, 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 Peter White, Peter White, some years ago, yeah, they they, yeah, they often had um, their lodge meetings there on the odd occasion, yeah. Your worshipful brother Frank's uh, portrait still mm. hangs in the, uh, uh, across the way from the Austin Hospital, Warringal Hospital. He spent so much time there in his latter years um, and donated so many things. There's a big portrait of worship brother Frank uh, up on the wall as you walk up the steps from opposite the bowling club. Yeah. Yeah. Peter Knight was the guy who had the, had the pub there about you know, yeah. oh, 20 years, 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. At one stage, Richmond did meet in the town hall in a special room off the side of the town hall in Richmond. And they... There's, there's notes in the in the minutes about buying a carpet and all sorts of things and an organ for that building and they rented that for a stack of years but this would have been all around the world where masonic lodges didn't have the funds up front to, to you know to to build your own building straight away so you you rent what you can you mentioned Frank Bibby. I think, um, is that the same Frank Bibby who was president of Fitzroy Football Club in the 1970s? I don't know, but he was master in 1977 mm. of Burnley. Mm. Burnley? Yeah, it was. Let me just check that for you. Actually, while Joel is checking that, brethren, are there any other any other questions for Ian? Yeah, it was uh, Frank Binney, um, Burnley Lodge, number 299, third Tuesday in every month. And uh, he, he served two years straight away and he died in 1989. Um, I've got his details only because he was the 77th master and, and a member of our my year group and um, we had 41 lodges in our year group at that time um, and uh, they spread quite a way through the system of course. Yeah, Burnley Lodge met in uh, the old Richmond Temple too. Yeah. Thank you Joel. Pleasure. Well, if there are no other questions uh, with for Ian, um, I'm happy to uh, to move on to the next part of our uh, uh, of our agenda for this evening, uh, and that is meeting a member. Uh, and I think first off the uh, off the rank is Brother David Gale. I'll hand over to you, David. Hello, everyone. I'll uh, astonish you by saying that I was born at a very young age, and uh, started eating and never looked back. But um, <laughs> I was born in uh, in Sydney in 1961 uh, in a suburb called Carlton, and that probably explains my uh, my love for the blue baggers. I was one of four, two sisters and a brother, and I was number three in that uh, in that queue. Uh, keen soccer player, mad keen tennis player, and later in life I did a lot of uh, triathlons. I know looks can be disturbing, but I was rel relatively fit. <laughs> I did an apprenticeship in electrical and mechanical instrumentation. 
several follow-up industrial and engineering modules. So my work life was was electrical, which largely followed my dad's steps too. He was an electrical mechanic. And um, I sort of fell into that. I didn't really know what I wanted. Um, but that led me to become um, uh, quite, uh, quite well known in the uh, electrical engineering area of uh, harmonic mitigation. And I do a lot of training of engineers now. Um, I got married in 1980. Yes, I was only 19. And um, my lovely wife, Joyce, we are still married. January this year, we had our 40th wedding anniversary. And um, we have two sons, two daughter-in-laws, one grandson, and one other grandchild being incubated due late uh, July. We don't know if that's a boy or girl yet. Um, my other passions in life, apart from Freemasonry now, was I was uh, very keen in motorsport, spent about 20 years uh, at a national level, state and national level in that area, as, um, as crew chief and uh, engineering, um, chassis and suspension setups. That was my main passion and I covered Things like sports sedans, Formula 3, sorry, Formula 4, Formula Ford, open wheelers, that sort of thing. Uh, a few national and state titles as a reward for that. It was, it was, it was terrific. Um, from a Masonic perspective, my journey started at a very young age because both my, my father and my grandfather were very keen Freemasons. They did a lot of traveling. A lot of travelling, and uh, I can remember one time we went with them as kids, my brother, myself, and a, and a friend, and we had my father and grandfather in the front of the car, us three boys in the back, and we towed a caravan to Corion. And they went to a country meeting. We didn't care. It was just a holiday for us. And um, on the way back, we couldn't understand why everyone was beeping and waving at us and then had a look of horror on their faces as they went past and overtook us. So we stopped at Mount Victoria in New South Wales to get a hamburger and realised that my brother had put a just married sign on the back of the caravan. <laughs> so there was my dad and his father as the parents, <laughs> three boys in the back. <laughs> anyway, much to my dad's horror. <laughs> Um, they, um, both, both my grandfather and my father were um, masters of uh, lodge temperance in Sydney. That was a New South Wales, well, a dry lodge. And I have both their installation invitations. Uh, my grandfather was um, the 27th of March, 1951. My dad was the 26th of March, the 28th of March, 1967, at the Masonic Hall in Sydney. I have a lot of Masonic memorabilia from those times that my dad kept. Here's his dad book from his year as the master of Lodge Temperance. And it was even the summons for when he was um, nominated in 1951. And uh, both, both Dad and uh, Gavi, my grandfather, were 33rd degree Masons. And they were both raised to that degree, and I thought it's the right term, on the 10th of November, 1990. And this is uh, Dad's certificate. Of, um, Green Council in 33rd degree of the ancient and accepted right of Freemasonry. He was the Grand Sovereign Inspector General. So our history, while I didn't know at the time, was, uh, was quite important. And I have a lot of dad and my grandfather's regalia. And uh, like Ron said last week, um, uh, I carry my regalia around in my dad's old case. It's still got his name on it and his phone number before the, nine, the nines were introduced. And uh, 
my interest came back to it in around about 2006 where one of the members of our racing team was a mason. He was a secretary for nine years of a lodge. I don't know where. He lived in Sandown, near Sandown Park. Um, I can't remember the lodge that he was, uh, he was a member of. But we chatted about it off and on, did the usual jokes, you know, like bark, bark, you know. <laughs> and um, uh, my dad passed away in 2007, and that was sort of the end of it for me. Till about four years ago, I think, I saw on Facebook that the Freemasons had a display at the Box Hill Festival. And um, I was just sitting there lounging, doing nothing, and I thought, bugger this, I'm going to take all my dad's certificates, and he's got about 30 of them. And went down to the festival and looking to have some light shed on what they were. And, and if I was going to join, I wanted to join a lodge for some reason. I don't ask me why, but had the same regalia as what my father had. Anyway, um, at, the, um, at the festival was Peter Aiken. And, um, and Peter um, looked at my certificates and uh, my dad's. And uh, he he he, uh, he helped a little bit, but some of them he just didn't know, didn't know what they were, I suppose. And um, one thing led to another, and I was introduced to Richmond Lodge Number Eighty Nine. And um, I went to the South a couple of times. And I met the brethren, and uh, the rest is history. Really, I became um, I'm now the inner guard, and uh, and I'm loving it. It's a challenge. But um, I'm excited about the future, where it will take me within Freemasonry. And I really want to, um, one of my goals is to uh, join the Scottish Rite and uh, just follow my dad's journey a bit and see what he saw in it, and my grandfather for that matter. So that's uh, a little bit about me and a little bit about my short Sonic history and what I'm looking forward to in the future. So thank you. David, thank you very much for that. That 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 was uh, truly excellent, and I I appreciated all the uh, the visual aids that you had as well, <laughs> uh, brethren. Uh, I'll I'll throw it uh, things open for uh, if anyone's got any questions for David. But uh, before anyone else, David, I'll jump in. Um, your brother is is he a Freemason? No, he's not. He has he hasn't shown any interest, but he does ask about it. Okay. Maybe you share some of your father's and grandfather's regalia with him. You might, you might, uh, uh, you might have a burning desire to join Freemasonry. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Brethren, any other questions for David? David, I, Joel, uh, David, I have a question. Lodge Temperance in uh, New South Wales was it uh, Gladstone Temperance or just Temperance? Uh, I think it was um, just Lodge Temperance. Um, okay. Um, thank you. In the list number one one seven nine. In the list of members, which is in the on the in the notice paper, yeah, in the um, yeah. Would the name Westheimer come up, please? W e s t h e i m e r. Long shot. Looking. Oh, it'll, be in, yeah, it'll be down the bottom. <laughs> Roughly what year do you think? Well, I thought around uh, I thought around the, the 50s to 55s. Okay. But no. It, it, oh, um, uh, he um, is my father-in-law. So that's okay. why I asked the question. Yeah. There's a... Walter, Wareham, Waterhouse, Weed, Wilson, but um, no West. Okay, just an odd shot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Joel. Any other questions, brethren? That's. Uh, I'll take that as a no. Again, thanks a lot, David. Um, we'll now move over to uh, our next meter member who is Victor. Victor, are you there? Yeah, hello. Brilliant, I'll hand over to you. <laughs> hello, everyone. Um, my name is Victor. <laughs> I'm from Colombia. Um, uh, I'm from a 
town called Pamplona, which is a colonial town, first capital of Colombia, actually, <laughs> after the revolution. Um, my family is a small family. Uh, my dad, which is a doctor, my mom, a biologist, um, my sister is an anthropology and me. <laughs> we grew up all in, involved in arts and in a cultural life all the time. Mm, mom and dad, they were always working in the university. So they have all this connection with theater and music and library, any like, show that was going on around in our town, we were there. <laughs> and I always uh, find fascinated with the artist's life. So then I decided to become a musician. <laughs> um, it's been a long journey for me in coming over from Colombia to Australia after I finished my degree on jazz and modern music. I came to live to Australia to have a different experience um, and trying to find new paths, new ways in which I could just like, um, I don't know, make music. <laughs> um, during that process, um, I asked my dad about um, Freemasonry. Um, always been fascinated about it. It's always been in our house, in our home a big part of it, like my dad always hosted uh, barbecues, things. Um, also like little meetings with his brethren at home. And I always like found this kind of connection um, fascinated because he loves it. <laughs> um, then uh, when I came here to Melbourne, um, I started talking to him and then he got in touch with Matt via Facebook <laughs> and ask him if I could just join and meet a few of you guys <laughs> for um, for a dinner. Um, I must say that that was a very important experience. I didn't know anyone, didn't knew anyone there. Um, and the feeling that I got that night, the first time that I, when I did the meet and greet of meet and greet after I just have a chat online with Matt was very warm, very welcoming. Uh, it just feel, it, it felt right, to be honest. <laughs> it felt really good. Um, and then I just find out that this will be also a way on, in which I could just connect with that part of my ancestry, like my dad and my grandfather, which I know always have like a big question about it because we didn't talk about it very deeply. It was always there, but we didn't connect deeply in that sense. But then after um, I got my initiation in Richmond Lodge, which was beautiful for me, um, an experience in, in which I grow as a person since like a lot in character and morals, like felt like in, it really made me think about myself in a way that I, that I never had thought it. <laughs> I don't know if it makes sense. <laughs> um, after that, um, being Im involved in, in, in these kind of situations in which meeting people of Australia like real Australian people, because I was always with international students. Um, I was always um, like more or less with immigrants as well. But now with you guys, I always get the real Australian thing <laughs> as well, <laughs> if it does make sense, which makes me feel Australian. Uh, you know what I mean? It's very important for me, this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, uh, also, the conversation with my dad and Freemasonry is being like super um, mutual now because now he, he didn't have like anyone at home that he could share that with. And now we can actually have conversations like, uh, how is the right there? Like, what, what do you guys do there? Like, what is the difference? He will share with me these kind of details. <laughs> 
but um, yeah, it's been amazing. Um, also, what else I can tell you? Like, my life in Australia has just been amazing. It's, there is no other way that I could express that. Got married, um, been playing in the street in Melbourne a lot. I've been a busker in Burke Street. Um, that was a ma magnificent experience because it was direct contact with the people. It's something that, um, as a performer, it really like change you because there is not like um, nothing protecting you. When you are in a stage, there is always the stage. You know what I mean? And then when you are in the street, <laughs> there is no one around you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's like very, you know, very personal. And sometimes people will stand to you and talk to you or drop you a coin or something, meeting a lot of people. But um, also like became such a good performer for doing it. Like when you go to university and play music, um, you kind of practice for, for just like the exam or the things that you have there. But then when you are trying to win the heart of a person because you need to pay your bills, <laughs> that's totally different, man. Like that really <laughs> hits the spot there. Um, um, what else I can say about my life now? Well, now we are trying to move to Lismore. That's new for me. Uh, another change in my life is because we want to be close to our family. Um, we want to have a family as well with my wife. So we're trying to set her down in a more quiet environment and find new ways to live. Um, and that's it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Victor, that, that, that was truly excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, really I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, uh, I just mentioned to the brethren, um, Victor mentioned yeah. that he will be moving away. He's currently the junior deacon in our lodge, but he'll be moving to New South Wales and, and hopefully continuing his uh, Freemason um, uh, development uh, over in New South Wales, but we'll see how we go. But I just want to say again, thank you, Victor, for your talk. And, oh, for, and also and for, for um, uh, all the support, the support that you've given to Richmond Lodge over the years. No, thank you. Thank you for everyone as well for their support and for being with me. <laughs> and I can, me uh, I can, teaching me a lot as well. <laughs> I, I can certainly say on behalf of the Lodge, you will be missed. Uh, I will miss you guys as well. <laughs> hey, Dick. Hey, Dick. Hey, Dick. Uh, um, um, sometimes I can... In Australia, in Australia, and your dad, he's a great guy. I've never met him in person, but he's a great guy. Tell him that next time you're talking. I will, I will tell him. Thank you very much, Matt. You've been wonderful as well. Uh, you're Are a you wonderful, wonderful friend, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for everything you've done. Seriously. Yeah, likewise. Bye. Brethren, any other questions for Victor? Just that one, Sid, when does Victor go and is he connected to a lodge up there yet? Has he been given details? Um, I'm going the 27th, um, which is very soon. Uh, I haven't done any connection yet with any lodge up there. Cause, okay, Victor, uh, oh, Matt, Matt can Matt probably hear me too. too. Matt, yes. if you get on to Grand Lodge, Ask them Ask for a connection, them to, connection to, to Grand Lodge of New South Wales, Wales or we'll give you a connection to a lodge in Lismore. Definitely under that already. Um, Good on you, mate. Yeah, no, definitely under that already. I suspect Victor will remain a member of Richmond until everything's sorted out. And we're actually working with the district with um, with Wayne and just sorting that out. We've got some contacts. It's bit hard at the moment just to work through all that, but it's definitely in play. Um, I'm sure Victor's Masonic career, if you want to call it that, or his friendship with Freemasonry is not over, and um, it'll just continue on. I know that it's really important to him. So, yeah, no, definitely underway. But thanks for pulling that out. If anyone's got any suggestions, uh, 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 Joel, Joel, Joel here. Uh, Victor, I have some friends in this mob, and uh, the, 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 
uh, DGIW up there, I know personally, uh, and we can line you up with a lodge, the, the right sort of lodge in Lismore for you uh, if you need that contact. Uh, you can get that by asking Matt for my details. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll ask Matt for the details. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem at all. I can tell you you won't be left lonely. Okay, thank you very much. All right, brethren, as uh, there's no other questions, um, we can certainly move on. Uh, brethren, as I mentioned before, um, we do have postings on YouTube um, which covers some of the, uh, we, we generally do a meter member, um, generally in lodge, but we're also doing it online. And there's a few up on, on, the, on YouTube as well. So please feel free to go and have a look at, uh, at those as well. Um, Matt, I might ask you to talk a bit on the uh, Q&A &A night coming up for new members. I will do it a tick sit. I think we're going to try and squeeze one more meter member out. Is Carl, I think Carl's on the call. Sorry, was Carl doing one as well? My apologies, it's, I didn't see it on the list here, but that's fine. Uh, Carl, welcome. Yes, oh, thank you. <laughs> and over to you. <laughs> yeah, good evening, Braden. Okay, um, a little bit about me. Um, and I think it might be worth, you know, if, if you want to know me, you need to go back to where, I'm, where I came from and um, what I did when I was younger, because I think that was a very important part of who I am today. So I was um, born and raised in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So not far from where, uh, where Victor came from, uh, but an entirely a different country, um, multicultural. Um, and Sao Paulo in particular being this you know, massive metropolis um, had um, second, third generation immigrants from pretty much every every part of the world. Uh, and in particular, my family has um, uh, its origin in Italy. So um, I had that big influence, particularly of my from my nono, uh, who taught me a lot when I was young. And I always remember a few things that um, he always told me was to value freedom and uh to learn to work with my hands because i never knew when i was going to to need and, and be in a situation where i might have to do some heavy lifting and uh but also he said never stop never stop learning never stop studying and um and you know we've out of um i think all together with my sisters i had two sisters and um about um 20 cousins and my my nono always made sure that we all made all the way to university at least right and um and post graduation if we had the opportunity um sao paulo for those who don't know is um a very large italian city and so there's um, a big italian community they migrated there uh, in the late 1800s um, a number of families were given a, a plot of land to, to go there and, um, and break the ground. Uh, and, uh, and that attracted a lot of, of Italians. And they were replacing a slave force, uh, which is Brazil, Brazil's biggest shame, 400 years of uh, black slavery. And when the blacks were, um, were freed, in, um, 1888, they opened the doors for, for immigration from Europe. Um, as I said, it's a big shame because a, a lot of the problems that you, you see today in, in Latin America is because of that totally unstructured way in which the, the slaves were freed. So basically, they, well, you had for 400 years people who were under the mastership of, um, of an owner. Uh, and overnight they were put on the streets and they, they said, you don't have a roof anymore, you don't have a job, and uh, I'm not feeding you anymore. And so it was totally unstructured, uh, total disaster. Um, so I had that, that influence of, um, of you know, that Italian immigrants fighting, fighting their way through and finding their position in society. 
And um, interestingly enough, Sao Paulo is also a very large Japanese city. Uh, it's one of the largest Japanese uh, populations in the world. So there is still very strong links between uh, people in, in Sao Paulo and, uh, and, and Japan, many cities in Japan. And um, I remember you know, my close friends and neighbors and uh, students since very early school were Japanese. So I, I learned a lot from them in their ways of, of thinking. So I was fortunate enough to get into martial arts since very young. Um, and um, so many, many years of different Japanese martial arts. And that taught me a lot as well in terms of discipline and um, particularly, I think, for anyone who wants to be good with the Masonic rituals, the power of repetition. Right? So if you, if you want to, you know, to master a martial art, you need to practice and practice and practice. And um, I don't know if you remember this quote from Bruce Lee. He says, don't fear a man who has practiced practice 10,000 10, kicks, fear that one who practiced one kick 10,000 times. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so I think that sort of uh, uh, put a lot of discipline in my life. And, um, and it's what led me to make that decision to leave Brazil at uh, the age of 29. Um, what I could, could see is that society had lost its balance. So there was more and more the big gap between the, you know, the rich and the poor. Um, it was a transition from a right-winged military dictatorship under which I was raised um, with very little freedom, with a lot of censorship in the media, um, going to university you really need, needed to be aware of who you were sitting next to uh, in public transport. You needed to be aware of what subjects you would um, talk to someone about. And uh, I could see the society suddenly, you know, the military left power. And, um, and when they opened up, it swung from, from right. And we could see the left coming in a totally unbalanced way. And um, I couldn't see much future there. And I think I was, unfortunately, I was right in my predictions and I left in uh, 89. So I've been in Australia now for just, um, just over 30 years. Uh, I came here as um, I had graduated in Brazil, had a number of years in what was the preamble of uh, information technology. And I was lucky enough here to have the opportunity to continue my studies, did another 10 years of, um, of post-graduation studies while working full time and, um, and managed to find my path back into, into IT and um, had a, what I would consider a successful career, 20 years now as a CIO, a Chief Information Officer uh, for some reasonably large companies, and, um, and I couldn't complain. I could not complain of, of the opportunities I had to study and, um, and, and develop my career in Australia. Beginning was tough though, and set back by a number of years, uh, especially the challenges with the language and not knowing anyone. Uh, but uh, slowly, slowly, you study and you persevere and you're honest and um, hardworking and eventually the doors um, started to open. Um, I was the first person in my family to, to leave the country. And I was also the first person, as far as I'm aware, uh, to join uh, Freemasonry. So I don't, uh, I envy you guys sometimes when I say, oh, my grandfather and my great grandfather and my uncles. Are... No, I didn't have that, right? um, no, no, no one in my family. Um, and I was prompted, um, I have this habit of reading uh, and um, um, one of the things that I've, I've, I couldn't find really was um, good books or uh, good lessons about um, ethics and, um, 
and, 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 and morale. Right? So uh, I, I found, I met a few people who were Freemasons, and I found them to be very honest and you know, good, good people, genuinely good. And, um, and especially with a particular sense of, of, of values and character that uh, I said, well, it's not the, not the normal people you, you meet on the streets. And, um, and that made me curious and they you know, introduced me. And then one day I had the pleasure of a visit of uh, 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 Ian Burgess and Paul Ray. And um, and, then, and then you guys welcomed me with, to the to the Richmond Lodge, and um, I've joined. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, in every opportunity, I think I've always been in the in the team uh, since since uh, I, I became my master mason, and and I, I no I intend to continue there. I was um, fortunate enough to, to be a master of the lodge for two years in a row. And um, then I moved, uh, moved to to Essendon, and, and really made it quite dif difficult for me to attend lodge. But since I came back to Doncaster East, I've rejoined, and um, I'm enjoying it. So that's my story. That was excellent, Colin, and really do appreciate the uh, your uh, your input. Um, and and obviously you you certainly are one of the valued members of Richmond Lodge uh, as well. I'd, I'd like to add. Um, I'll throw uh, the uh, I'll throw the session open for questions. But again, before anyone gets in, I'll I'll start. Carl, I was rather um, fascinated to find out that there's a there's a huge Japanese um, community in Sao Paulo. Uh, what was the reason that they migrated there? Uh, same reason. It, it's opportunity. So they went there in the I think 1910 uh, was the when the immigration opened up, and they they went there particularly to that area in the out, outskirts of São Paulo, where they um, they went to um, to some small far, farmlets producing uh, green produce. Okay. Um, Thank you. Brethren, any other questions for Carl? Sidney, if I may, this is Ian, a uh, couple of things. Since the moment I met Carl, he was always a Freemason. Yes, we initiated him, but he was always a Freemason. The other part of it is, is it not deja vu, interesting, whatever you like? He came here in 89. <laughs> Well done, Carl. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Ian. Brendan, any other questions? I'll take silence as no. So again, I'd like to say a thank you to Carl and all the other brethren that uh, gave us a bit of insight into into who they are. Um, and I think it's important, brethren, to uh, that the brethren of Richmond Lodge actually do form much stronger bonds with each other. And this is just a small opportunity uh, or uh, encapsulates this um, option for us to be able to do this within the Lodge. So again, thanks a lot, Carl. One of the things I must admit that I enjoy about Richmond Lodge <clears throat> is that we certainly are a multinational Lodge. Myself as, a, as an ex-South African and an ex-Kiwi as um, Steve Austin regularly reminds me. Uh, and then we've also got Ron Pinar who's also a, a, an ex-South African. So uh, we certainly are a multinational Lodge and a multicultural one as well. I've got a question actually. Yes, please go ahead. I just worked out how to unmute myself on this. I've never used this this platform before. It was for the uh, for Carl. I understand that uh, you know lots of Italians went to Argentina, and Argentinians tend to speak Spanish with an Italian accent. <laughs> Is this does the same thing apply in Sao Paulo with so many Italians? Do they speak Portuguese with an Italian accent? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Especially the you know, if you go to the south of south part of Brazil, um, even down where my wife uh, came from, uh, there, there's this Portuguese with a very heavy Italian accent. Yeah. yeah good. Okay. Yeah. But other, other, other small question. I understand there are lots of Freemasons in Brazil, a large number. Is that correct? 
I I can't tell you. I don't know. There's lots of there's lots of jurisdictions. I think each state has more than one jurisdiction, and I understood it to be a very high, a very high number actually of Freemasons in Brazil. I'll go and find out how many. Yeah, sorry, I can't help you. Thank you, and that was our grandmaster elect, who I'm sure will be filling those uh, those large shoes very soon. Um, and I'm sure he'll be uh, intimately uh, aware or uh, aligned with uh, with the Freemasons in Brazil, because one of the things we'd like to do locally is obviously increase our numbers uh, as well. Um, brethren, I just got a couple of things. Um, we're talking about the multinationalism of Richmond Lodge. Um, we've got another brother from South America, from um, Colombia, that's going to be joining. Sorry, from Venezuela, that's going to be joining us. Um, the brother Eduardo Tinio. Uh, and obviously, once uh, Lodge is up and uh, or we can meet in person again, we will be going through that process. Um, and we've also got Andrew Shen, who is an initiate, um, who is, I believe, originally from Taiwan. So we'll be looking forward to him joining our lodge um, as well. Um, Matt, again, I might pass this part on to you, the uh, question for the quiz. Thanks, Sid. Um, next, well, coming up, we're going to do a big welcome, like we did earlier in the year, for people that are interested in, in learning a little bit more about Richmond Lodge and Freemasonry. Earlier in the year, we had a beer and pizza um, night, and um, we watched an episode of um, Met the Freemasons, sorry, Inside the Freemasons, a Netflix show. We had 17 people join and really it created some good interest in what we're doing. Shortly next week we're going to do it again. Um, this time there'll be no beer, at least not our beer, and you'll have to be by your own pizza. Unfortunately we can't supply because you'll be at home. Um, what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to do a couple more Meet the Members and um, we've also been putting these Met the Members up on YouTube and we'll be featuring these over the next week. Um, but we'll do a couple more Meet the Members next week and we'll do a quiz. And um, obviously, like we do every time, give everyone a warm welcome. Um, what we need for the quiz, though, is some questions. Um, so some questions for the quiz. They could be fun facts. They could be questions, but really just want to make it interesting. And questions of general knowledge about Freemasonry. Um, Look, I don't expect that we're going to get answers tonight about the questions, but um, how should we organise this, Sid? How should people reply with questions? Should they go to our Facebook page? Should we put a post up there and say, look, we've got a trivia night coming up and we'd like some questions for the trivia night? Um, how should we do it? What do you think? Matt, I suggest we do both. I think I think put it up on, on our Facebook page so that the word actually gets out about it. Um, but also, brethren, I mean, those that have Matt's uh, email address or is able to get in contact on that, please feel free to uh, email him the question. And don't forget the answer, please, because the last thing we want our poor secretary to do is go and do a whole lot of research on your questions. <laughs> so please include the answers with the questions. That would be very helpful to Matt. <laughs> what, we'll, what we will do is make them healthy choice and we'll, we'll use a, an online tool to make it a lot of fun um but look it's going to be a great night share with a friend i heard it, it, look it worked earlier in the year we've got we've got you were there Sid. what were you thought about what we did earlier in the year sorry matt i missed that you were talking about the uh the the the, the, the q and a the um netflix night that was yeah. a good night, wasn't it that certainly was a great night, brethren, and, and uh, it was good having, you know, the large numbers of, of prospective members come along and uh, and quiz us on Freemasonry. In fact, watching that show inside Freemasonry, uh, and thanks to our brethren in, uh, from the UK for uh, putting something like that together, um, that was actually very helpful. It certainly opened the door to um, the interest that people had, and we, had, we, we really had an amazing night. We're looking forward to doing more of those um, as an opportunity for growing the numbers of Freemasons uh, or sorry, tell me this on that. What's, um, what was interesting about that night is um, it came up with a discussion with David Gale last year. We were doing a, a thing at Box Hill and we're talking, we did a stand at the Box Hill um, Indonesian show and I was there with David Gale and we were talking about what helped us to learn more about Freemasonry. And that show, um, we chatted about that show, I hadn't seen it at that stage. Then at our Christmas party, um, Andrew came along, Andrew Shea, who has joined the lodge since, or he's, he's in the process of joining. He suggested that we should do the night in January. Unfortunately, he was in quarantine 
but he couldn't join us in January because he'd been overseas at Christmas time with family. But um, it's, it's amazing that we, it, there was just a big groundswell about that. A lot of people have been watching that show, so we definitely need to get that in as part of next week as well. So we're still putting it together. It's going to be a great night. And now uh, please have a question. Please get your questions in. Matt, I'll just add there that there are websites or, or platforms nowadays where you can actually get um, you know, quizzes uh, and questions. So that, that's also an option for us to hook into as well. But obviously, we want to make this as inclusive as possible. So brethren, whatever you can send to Matt uh, or even on the Facebook page will be much appreciated. Uh, Matt, can I ask you a folklore uh, question? Um, I've, I've seen, um, I've, I'm trying to think which book it was, the the uh, the picture of the Freemason with a goat. Where does that where does that in folklore fit into Freemasonry? I'm not going to be able to answer that. <laughs> Ron, I've always believed it's the Masonic emblem, Masonic song, "Goat Riders in the Sky." But no, it's I've never. Never, never known any truth to the story at all. We've uh, we've addressed this uh, at uh, many map sessions over the last five years. I've been involved. Yeah. Um, I've had many explanations, uh, but I believe it's a mixture of the letters between B A O T on on the certificate. Got mixed up once is the best logical version I've heard. Um, but there are many other. Uh, Yes, that's where it comes from. Yes, Steve, I've never, never seen anything that makes sense. We may need some um, members to come along, Steve, and um, friends to um, just at the answers. <laughs> I have a, uh, I have a poem in my grandfather's uh, um, sonic case, where it's, and it's called "When Father Rode the Goat." It's a bit funny. But he would read it at the South occasionally, as I understand it. So maybe I should share that at some stage. Yeah. And David, we look off. We'll, we look forward to that rendition when we are back at Lodge again. Mm. Yes. Okay. We'll Point that in the South. <laughs> 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 we won't, won't let you off that easy. <laughs> um, Matt, is there anything else before we close the meeting? Oh, maybe just a roll call if anyone hasn't had the opportunity, but I think that's about it. Yep. Uh, thanks, Matt. If anyone wants to say a, a, a quick hi at least and, and obviously a note that, that you were here, that'll be very helpful. Yep. Okay, I'll go first. Thanks, guys. Good night. Uh, thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Ian. Um, always good to get a uh, an update and refresher on the, um, the background of Richmond Lodge. Um, I trust and I'm sure that everybody's Busily learning their ritual for our, um, our first degree. Yeah, and and our, and our deacons are out practicing with their their brooms in the back backyard or whatever. So um, yeah, don't forget, great time to learn your ritual when you're isolated like this. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> yes, I've been outside opening and closing the door. On <laughs> <laughs> Cameron here. You've done extremely well tonight. One of the best yet. Yeah, good night. Yeah, good greeting, night. greetings from Admiral Collingwood Lodge. Um, that was a, a great thing to just hear you guys speaking about uh, what's happening and uh, I hope everything continues on well and hopefully we'll be back in the lodge room soon. Yeah, nice thanks for joining us, Wayne. Thanks, Wayne. Not a problem. And on the phone, Jack. Keith, then. Yes, Keith. Good night. I'm on the phone, and so good night to you, guys. Good night, Keith. Thanks, right. Good night, brothers. Well, good yeah. night from him, and good night from me. Yeah. I think as Dudley Cook used to say, one of them. <laughs> uh, actually, that was the Ronnies. The Ronnies, was it? I knew yeah. something like that. <laughs> good night from me. And good night from you. <laughs> All right, yeah, good night, guys. It must have been the two of us, Ron. <laughs> the Ronnies. <laughs> yeah, you, got, you guys are a bit shorter and a bit uh, bit lighter, I think, but yeah. <laughs> Bernie, are you still there? Who? Bernie. Bernie. No, Bernie's not.
No. All right, guys. See you next week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks a lot, brother. Right. I'll see you next, see you in a couple of weeks. I've got an online meeting with Brunswick next Tuesday, so I'll uh, I'll log on in a couple of weeks. A quick one about the goats. I took my first visit to Whittlesea in Shedding Rain, and I pulled up to a first degree. And my mentor at the time said, "You haven't been to a first degree in the country yet, have you?" And there's three goats tied up out the front of the lodge. <laughs> <laughs> I had a hard connection for about thirty seconds, and that was Wayne Young, Sid. So you can uh, imagine how funny that was. All right, I'm signing off. I'll see you. Uh, everyone stay well, and uh, we'll speak to you soon. Thanks, Watch for Brothers. Thank you, Dave. Cheers. Dave. Night, all. Good night, man. Night, Ian. Night, Ian. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yep. Cheers, Dave. Thanks, Ed. It was a good night. It was a really good night. I enjoy that. Yeah. Um, what's your brother Tudor? You are muted. You need to unmute yourself. Matt, can you assist? No, I can't from this end. He has to do it himself, unfortunately. Sorry, you've got, you got to do it on your side. <laughs> it's a little icon with a, a red a red microphone on it in the, in the bottom of the screen. So what click on the main button. Click what? on the main part of the screen. Can you hear and, me now? Yes, yeah. now we can. There we go. Yeah. It, it's been absolutely fascinating um, hearing uh, your experience and your members over uh, or down under. Um, it's completely different to in the UK. Um, I, I did uh, take note that the Scottish institution was actually um, came with members before the actual uh, the union was actually the, the Scottish uh, constitution was made. So, in different lodges up there, they they do it completely different. And of course, in the United Grand Lodge of England, um, that was formed, and so therefore we we all should work under the same sort of constitution. But um, it's been absolutely fascinating to um, hear all your experiences, and uh, you've got such a broad specter of. Um, members really um we we, we 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 live in a small town really um we're 100 miles uh west of london um so we do find we, we're, we're quite handy to uh where prince charles lives we're 10 miles from charles not that that, that means anything at all <laughs> um and, and another thing was that uh, the gentleman doing the reading that we said about the uh, moon um, masons meeting um near the um, near moon and we've got Forward, a lodge, yes we've got a lodge near us who still keep up that uh, that procedure that they meet on the nearest monday to a full moon and they meet okay. uh, i think 10 10 times a year but uh, anyway uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I haven't seen Ruben, but I'm sure that he has enjoyed it. And thank you very much. So I'll I'll, um, I'll finish with this a little bit. It's something that I I do at uh, my own lodge, which uh, really is um, Brethren of the Mystic Tie. The night is drawing nigh. Our work right. is done. The feast is o'er. This toast must be the last. Good night. Good night. Again, good night. Repeat the happy refrain. Happy have we met. Happy may we part. And happy meet again, and then I, I, I used to sometimes go on and do the the, the, the Tyler's talk, but I will finish it at that. And thank you very much, and look forward to seeing you all again. Brilliant, and glad you could join us. Thank you. Excellent. Cheers. Thanks, Matt. That, Cheers. that was a brilliant night. Really enjoyed it. I think it was a fantastic effort. Yeah, we're um oh. next week will be fun too. We're looking, looking, looking forward to that. Yeah. Good night, brethren. Cheers, Ed.